Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous. With that in mind, I've digitally altered his voice, and I'm going to call him Matt tonight. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. It's an honor. Oh, thanks so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm just your typical average guy. I work. I play hard. I've grown up in Utah, so I'm a mountain boy. and. Uh, just love the outdoors, spend a lot of time hiking and fishing and not so much hunting anymore, but, you know, taking the side-by-side out, four-wheelers out, things like that. You know, just pretty much your average guy, nothing too special. Oh, I think you're selling yourself short there. You're definitely special. You say you feel in a way lucky to have had several experiences with dog men. Please expand on that for us. Well, lucky and kind of not, you know, I mean, it kind of forced me to face the reality. These things are real and I can't live in ignorance about it anymore, but it's not the kind of thing that, that I want to see all the time. Definitely not. But I do feel kind of one of the few that have actually seen these things and know that they're there and made it through the experience you know without any anything but emotional damage mental damage from it a little bit but i don't know how to explain that part of it but i do feel feel kind of special about it i guess in a way well it is a definite advantage in my opinion because now you know that they're out there and now that you do know they're out there, you're able to take certain actions that will help maybe prevent certain problems in the future that other people who don't know about their existence wouldn't take. Yeah, correct. Your encounter happened 27 years ago, but you still broke down when we had our first conversation. Do you think it's ever going to be relatively easy to reflect back on your encounters? Um, Yeah, like we've discussed, the more I talk about it, I think the the easier it gets to deal for me to be able to deal with the fear that it brings up because I've never experienced that before in my life. I mean, I've never felt that way ever. See, and I'm already getting kind of just thinking about it because it's burned into my memory for the rest of my life. I'll never forget this. It's impossible to, but the more I learn how to handle it, the easier it'll get. Yeah. But talking about it is how you start to, and sharing the experience with people, getting it out instead of keeping it bottled in, I think it helps to learn how to deal with it, definitely. That's right. It's all about exposure. I think you're doing really well just for you to come on and talk about those experiences. That says a lot about where you're at already with this. So I'm really impressed. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you known about me and what I do? Probably a little over a year now. I don't remember exactly how I came across your show, but I just listened. I don't even remember what episode I listened to first. I think it was the one where the two girls were in the car waiting for their boyfriends. And it just hooked me. And I was like, wow, there's other people out there that have gone through this and will know what I'm talking about. And I wanted to hear what they had to say. The more I listened, the more I thought, you know what? I can talk about this. I need to bring it up. I need to uh, share this with other people too, you know? So yeah, I've been, been a fan for over a year, I'd say. Yeah, that episode you just mentioned, that's episode 83. That was a pretty intense one. Why'd you wait so long to reach out to me and let me know about your encounters? Uh, it's, it's still super hard to talk about 
And I just, I, I guess for lack of anything, I guess build up the courage to be able to open up about this, really. Because it's been so long, I thought I had it buried, but it's always, always been there. Still, it will be there. So I figured, you know what, I need to, uh, I need to reach out and learn how to, to deal with this because obviously I'm going to be carrying it for the rest of my life. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're definitely going to be carrying it, but how you carry it, that's all that matters. And it sure sounds like you're carrying all this in a better way. So that's really good. I hope so. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You definitely are. All right, Matt, you've got several encounters to tell us about, so let's get to it. Please tell us about them now. We know it's hard for you to talk about them. Just do the best you can. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. So this friend of mine named John had another friend, and I'm going to call him Tim because I can't really... I remember the guy, but I really don't remember his name because after this happened, I never saw the guy again. So we decided to go camping, and at the time I had this, it was a 1978 K2 Blazer that I had fixed all up and redid it and lifted it, and it was a super nice Blazer at that time. And we decided, let's take the top off of it, because it was actually good weather, you know, for fall around here that year. So we took the top off, we went and picked up that Tim guy after we loaded all our gear and started to head up to this Canyon that my buddy knew about. And, uh, where I live, I live on the, the West side of the mountain range is where I grew up. And we were going to the back side of it, the East side of it. And there was a pass that we had to go up through. So we got the laser and took off and was enjoying the ride, stopped and got our food, got some beer got some firewood, had everything in the back of the blazer and got to this little town that you had to go through to uh, get to this canyon. But we had a super hard time finding it. I remember that because you had to go down some private lanes and these dirt roads. It was really difficult to find. So that just tells you how isolated it was and, and very unpopulated at that time. And I know we finally found the road and started to head up this canyon it was a little single lane dirt road and it's if you can call it a road it was bumpy and and rocky and it's just it's a good thing we had a four-wheel drive blazer because we would have never made it in anything else you know other than another four-wheel drive but so we started going up the canyon and it was kind of getting towards early mid-afternoon by that time and we got about halfway up the canyon and I looked over, I was driving obviously cause it was my vehicle, but I looked over to my left and tucked away back in these trees was this old, like broken down cement type of building. I don't know what it would have been for, but it was just more like ruins is how I can describe it. And being young and adventurous, we're like, hey, let's stop and go check this place out. You know, why not? We don't have anything else to do. So we stop and jump out and made our way over to this building. And I need to try to describe this to you the best I can because it was kind of a creepy looking place anyway. It was just broken down. The only thing that was left was like the uh, cement foundation, the cement walls, because part of it was all cement. And uh, there was a top floor, the main floor, and then a basement. But you could only pretty much get on the main floor when we walked in. Had to walk up these three steps. I remember these three big concrete steps that we had to walk up to get in there. And I started to notice this building was, or these rooms were highly graffitied for where it was at. It was surprising. But it wasn't your normal, you know, graffiti. It was like, it was pretty scary stuff, satanic stuff, and and not nothing that this you, nothing that I've seen before. I'll put it that way. It was these symbols and weird 
it was just weird. It was super weird. But then we walked into that, the ruins. It was on the main floor. And in the middle of the room, well, the middle of the floor was the opening for the basement. And uh, we kind of walked around a little bit and walked over, started heading over towards that hole where there were stairs going down into this pitch black, dark basement. And I remember the sun was just shining just right that it lit up the bottom part of the stairs by about three foot by three foot pattern, basically. And when we got to the close to the stairs, I remember smelling this smell. I've never smelled it before, and I will never forget it. But it smelled like putrid, rotting meat, urine, blood, and it just smelled like a dirty, filthy animal den. And I don't know how to, else to describe it. It was putrid. It was so strong and overwhelming. It was just unreal. But we got to that hole, and we were peering down into the bottom of the stairs, and there was an elk carcass laying at the bottom of the stairs but it was just the hind quarters of it that we could see and you could tell the thing was mangled and ripped up so we're trying to figure out what and how did that get down there why is that down there and we're trying to co coach each other to go you know talk each other into going down in the basement nobody there and but we were what was weird about it is we were whispering we just all of a sudden started whispering for some weird reason. And that part I still don't understand, but it was just really weird. Felt I don't know how to describe the the feeling that was there in that those or I can't even call it a building into the ruins. But all of a sudden from the backside of the stairs I heard this banging and this something huge moving. <sighs> And quick as lightning, that elk carcass phew, was gone. It was something snatched it and dragged it into the darkness and super quick. And it scared us all so bad that we turned around and started running towards the blazer, getting out of there. And the worst part about it was you could hear it coming up the stairs. Bam, bam, bam. But it stopped right before it would have came into the sunlight or in, you know, onto that room. But we got in the blazer and being dumb kids like we were, instead of heading back down and getting out of there, we were like, oh, it was probably just a, a cougar because we've got, we got a lot of mountain lion in that area and a lot of cats. And thinking, well, we'll be fine. Let's just head up to the campground. So that's what we did. We got up there and we found the spot and it was in this, it was on top of the, on top of the canyon, basically, we were clear up towards the top, but we were still in the tree line. But it was kind of a open meadow type of area. It wasn't very big, but you could tell not very many people had been there because there was just like one little fire pit, and you could just tell that that it wasn't a well used place. So we got camp set up, got everything going, started a fire, and had dinner and started drinking some beers and this is where this is where it gets hard for me um it got towards i want to i seem to remember it being like 12 that was after 12 12 30 one o'clock in the morning type of thing we were sitting there at the fire talking and my friend john was sitting straight across from me from the fire and then that tin guy was sitting to my right and the blazer was parked towards the right because that's where the road was at and uh we're just sitting there talking fire was going everything felt normal and then all of a sudden like this it just went super quiet like it was so quiet it was deafening and couldn't even hear the fire popping i couldn't hear my buddy talking and this weird weird feeling came over us came over the whole area it was just weird and uh like i said i was my friend was sitting across from me 
and I started, I remember feeling like time had stopped, but we are still moving in it. It was it, like a dream, but a terrifying dream. And I, I was looking at my friend, and I'm trying to describe this to you the best that I can as it happened. And it seemed like it took forever, but this, all this happened in seconds. But uh, I remember looking at my friend and I could see his eyes were getting like wide because we were all freaking out. We didn't know what was going on. And I looked up over his head and there, there it was. Hold on. Let me get a grip. Like I said, it's scary. Even thinking about it now. Oh, it is scary. I'll tell you what, Matt, let's take a break. We'll be right back. All right, Matt, whenever you're ready, please continue. All right, so try to pick up where I left off. Um, I looked up over over past my friend's head and towards the trees, and there there it was, this thing standing just on the outside of the light from the fire, just on the edge of the trees half in the darkness, half in the light, staring at me. It had this super wicked grin on its face. I don't even know how to describe this. But it had this long snout. And I could see all its teeth like it was smiling, but not a good smile. Like a, like a I got you now smile, you know. And uh, its eyes were squinted. And its ears were kind of laid back, but I could tell that it had big ears on it. And you could see the top parts of it with the, the tassels on the top of it or whatever you want to call them. And, and I couldn't see the color of its eyes because of the way the moon was and the way the light was from the fire and all that. They just looked like narrow black slits that were glistening. And, yeah, it's... This thing was super wicked looking. I mean, the closest thing that I've even seen that compares to it is in The Howling, where the guy changes into a, a werewolf in front of the reporter. But that's not even as as intense as this one was. It was it was evil looking, and I could tell it was kind of a dark gray color mixed with black, but it looked really mangy and dirty and his hair was all kind of clumped together like there was dried blood in it or who knows what it just it did not look well it didn't look well uh groomed <laughs> for lack of a better word it was really really dirty looking and uh so i remember like I said, everything was super quiet, super in intense, like time had stopped. And bam, my fight or flight instinct kicked in. I mean, before I even knew what I was doing, I was jumping up. And of course, I grew up in Utah. I always carry, you know, I had my 45 with me. My buddies had theirs with them. But I jumped up and I remember when I was standing up, I looked back at my friend and he must have seen how terrified I was because he hit the ground. I remember as I was rising, he was going down and he went on this half run, half crawl, like he was spinning his wheels kind of thing, just trying to get, get out of the way and get towards the blazer. And I remember I pulled up, I aimed right for its head. I remember looking right at it. And me and this thing had never broke eye contact while I was doing this, other than when I looked at my buddy for a split second. I looked back, that thing is still intensely staring at me. 
but when it's when I pointed the gun at its head, it it knew what a gun was. I'm telling you, the thing knew what I was doing because I remember his eyes kind of widening and and I got this feeling that it knew exactly like human awareness type of thing. Like it's so hard to describe. I don't know how to describe it to you, but this thing was was intelligent. It knew. And as soon as I pulled the trigger, it was gone. Boom. And I just emptied my whole mag. Bam, 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 bam. And all of a sudden, all the noise come crashing back in. Time started up again. Just everything. <clears throat> it was so weird how it all just snapped back to reality. And you could hear it running in the trees and crashing through the bushes. But it wasn't. I don't think it was leaving. I think it was circling us. But, um, and then while all that was going on, the, the other buddy of mine, Tim, he had made it to the blazer and had it started and was yelling, get to the, get over here. Let's go get to the blazer. And, uh, I remember I turned and started running and bent out or was passing up my one friend that was still in a half crawl. I remember grabbing him and, pulling him up and helping him and we just ran to the blaze as fast as we could and like i said the top was off of it so we just jumped over the side and and towards the back of the blazer because tim had already started taking off <laughs> he was our in gear and leaving and jumped in landed in the blazer i hit the floor uh, my other buddy hit the seat and by that time, we had already lit off. We were on the high-speed get-out, hitting and bouncing and jumping and sent up this huge dust cloud. And I remember right before, right as there was a turn that from the campground that went back onto the main road, and as we were making that turn, the and he was hitting the brakes, the brake lights, lit up behind us in this dust cloud and it was standing there watching us and i when i say standing it was standing that thing was like at least it was no less than seven foot seven and a half feet and uh big thing huge i i wouldn't even be able to guess a weight on it it was just a massive i've never seen anything like in my life but it wasn't like a puffed up bodybuilder or anything. It was muscular. It was really muscular, but it was more lean type of type of build to it and super tall. But I didn't get a good look at it in the cloud, in the dust cloud, but I, it was, it was there watching us. And, uh, so we took off, got down the Canyon, beat the blazer to death, getting out of there and just, got back down into that town and luckily this place was there's a trucker route that goes through there it's kind of a popular trucker route so there's all these little motels that were there and we were able to find one for the night but we got in the room and we couldn't even talk about it. Nobody could even talk about it. It was so freaky. It never even went, got our stuff, nothing. And uh, so, like I said, that's that's what happened that night. And then, you know, went home. And a couple of weeks later, because I can't live without the mountains, right? And even though I saw this thing, I'm thinking, okay, that was you know over there in that canyon it was the middle of the night you know i'm just because i wanted to go i lived right by the canyon that was on my side of the mountain range in fact i could get to it in like 10 minutes and like i said it was fall time and i love it up there so i've talked myself into this i'm going to go up to this little hiking trail that i knew about that was halfway up the canyon and and you make this turn, you go to a lake. But before the lake, there was pull-off spots. And I knew right 
where to go to get to this trail because it wasn't it wasn't an obvious trail you had to know it was there and this trail leads up to a rock slide big boulder rock slide you know we've got trees laid down in it logs over it i mean and it, you start climbing the rocks and go up the rock slide a bit up to this little overhang that you could sit down in and just enjoy the outdoors you know it's a nice quiet place and it's just mentally relaxing so i got up there climbed up the up the rock slide i got to the overhang and everything felt fine i was like and this is the middle of the day we're talking this is daylight and out of nowhere that same quiet and time stopping just zoomed in on me and i could feel that i was being watched and this time i just lit out of there i went running down that rock slide as fast as i could jumping on the rocks jumping over them tripping hitting the logs scraping myself up but i wasn't stopping for anything i was running down that as fast as i possibly could and i could hear it behind me i didn't see it because i didn't dare turn around but i could hear it behind me coming down jumping rocks jumping over the logs running coming and you could tell it was big and it was heavy and it was coming fast and uh i got down towards the end of the trail and there's this row of bushes that kind of blocked the road and blocked the view of the trail from where you park and i went running through those bushes i didn't even try to find the clearing where you go through i just went through them and i come out into the parking area and there were some people who, who had just pulled up <laughs> and I must have scared them and I must have scared them bad because they didn't even stop. They just, I remember them just whoa, tearing out of there. They were gone. And I jumped in my blazer and hit reverse. And I remember looking at the bushes thinking that thing's going to come through the bushes, but it never did. I got on the road and I went home and I was shaken up again i didn't know what to think you know i was thinking how could this be how could this how could this be you know we was on the other side of the mountain range and it was the same feelings and the same the whole situation only this time i was alone and it was the middle of the day but the thing about it the canyon that we were camping in where it happened it's directly on the other side of the canyon that I live by, and you could you could make that on horseback or, or hiking easily in a day. You could go from one side to the other, no problem. So I kind of started putting that together and I was thinking, man, you know, it had to have been the same thing, but they didn't know what to do. But that night, That night, I, I went to bed, and at the time, I was living in this old home. It had to have been built in the 30s or the 40s, and where my bedroom was, it was an add-on. It added on two bedrooms to this home, and so they were up a little bit. Like, my window was a good eight feet in the air, and there was, like, this old house trying to describe it to you the best I can so you can get a good picture of it. It was this old brick house and I had a long gravel driveway that came down the side of the house and then turned into the back. And it was all lined with big pine trees around the whole thing. It was, it was buried in the pine trees basically. And I had one road, one main uh, paved road that went by the house. The cemetery was across the street from it, and I had a street light, you know, right. They put a light right at the end of my driveway so I could see it, and I could see it from my bedroom window. And and uh, so I went to bed, and I like sleeping with the window open. I like it cooler when I sleep. 
And because of where I lived, it was, you know, fresh air. It was nice, cool, and clean. And, and I could see the light from my window. And I remember I was laying in bed. And I don't remember what time it got to be, but, and I don't even remember if I had been asleep or if I was still awake or it woke me up, but I started hearing something coming down the driveway and I could smell that smell that I described to you guys before this time mixed with some campfire. I don't even know how to describe it. It was, it was it filled my room and it was, I remember it being very, very sickening to me. And I could hear something coming down the driveway, down the gravel driveway. And it sounded like it was dragging something. And it was, you could tell it was big, it was heavy and it was dragging down the thing and heavy breathing. I, like I said, time stopped again but I was still moving in it. And I looked out the window and normally I can see that street light. I couldn't see anything. Everything was completely blacked out, completely blacked out. Room was completely blacked out. And then there it was. I could tell it was right there. The only thing that was between me and it was a screen. That is it. And it was right there staring at me. I couldn't see it. I could hear it. I could smell it. I could tell it was there and I could tell it was looking at me. And it was like it knew who I was, you know? And uh, I sleep, I, I always sleep with a shotgun. I, like I said, I grew up in Utah. I grew up around firearms. I always have them around me. I have my shotgun by my bed. And I reached for it, grabbed it, and racked it, and pointed at the window. And as soon as I did that, I mean, the very second I did that, whew, everything went back to normal, like everything. The smell was gone. Time started again. I could see the light. There was nothing in the driveway. I could see out the screen. You know, nothing was there that fast. So... Yeah, that's what I've been dealing with, and you know, I haven't 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 experienced anything like that before in my life, and I'm not sure I want to again. But like I say, in a weird way, I feel kind of lucky to have gone through it in a way, for lack of better words. But it kind of forced me now. I can't live in that world of of ignorance and and non-believing I have to believe because I have no choice <laughs> I went through it and so did two other people that were with me and like I said one of them we never saw him again after that and me and John barely even talked about it like it was like really in hush hush in reverence you know it was just it was too much it was too much to deal with at that time and uh but luckily, I I did have I did have somebody that came into my life that uh, kind of explained to me what they thought it might be, and uh, I worked with this Native American guy. He's a Navajo because we've got the Navajo res reservation here, and um, somehow me and him became really good friends, and I shared with him. He's one of the very few people that I actually talked to. Hold on. Man. Um, anyway, so I told him what had happened, explained the whole thing to him, and he thought that uh, there was something that they've known about the tribes have known about and that i had been marked to be tormented i guess because if that thing wanted me dead it could have killed me twice well three times actually because i know it could have caught me on that rock slide no problem absolutely no problem 
And then there, the night at the campground, it was less than 20 feet away from me. It could have had me dead to rights. I would have been done. And then again at my house. And like I say, the, the last two times I didn't see it, but I, it was it. I recognized it. If that makes any sense, it was the same. It was, the, it was the same creature, but so uh, that's about all I can describe on it. There is a particular physical feature that the dog man you saw at your campsite had that shakes you up more than any other feature it had. Please tell us which feature it was and why you found that feature so disturbing. It's smile, the, the snout on it and its teeth. And just the, it was, it's such a wicked sight still in my head. I can't even hardly describe it, you know, and, and it's what really sticks out because like I said, it was standing in the, in half in the dark, half in the light and still in the trees. I could only see its upper half. And, and that is something I just remembered too, when I did. It did something that kind of freaked me out when I went to, when I pulled my gun on it, it was moving like it was getting ready to point at me. And uh, that I just don't understand, but it was like, had me singled out for some weird reason. I didn't even pay attention to my other two friends. He didn't pay attention to them at all. And they were on the move. You know what I mean? It's just, that thing was just locked. Me and him were just locked. And, uh, but yeah, I'll never forget that it was, it was an animalistic human. It, it was so, the smile is just the grin was so wicked and, and evil looking. It's like so hard to describe how terrifying it really was, you know, but yeah, that's something that has burned into my memory. It'll never go away. I can shut my eyes right now and picture it. I mean, clear as day. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I mean, at all. There's no way I can. Oh, I'm sure you won't forget it. Understandably so. Why do you think it followed you guys from that basement to your campsite and pushed the issue with you when it could have kept its distance from you? You know, I really don't know unless it thought we were invading its home or there to take its prey from it or... It just was curious and wanted to see and, and torment us. I don't, you know, I mean, other than that, I can't think of a reason why it would follow us all the way up there, but it did. And it tracked us. I mean, it, it had, I'm sure it had no problem finding us, but I don't know because we didn't damage anything in there or leave anything behind or make loud noises or try to shoot at it or scare it or anything, you know, but I'm just thinking because we are coming down, we were going to go down into that basement, but I know nobody would have dared, especially after seeing that elk carcass and it disappearing into the dark the way it did. And you could hear everything moving down there. There's nobody was going down there. There's no way, but I don't, I don't know if it thought we were there for that. Or, you know, I don't think it was after us to kill us because obviously it would have, and we probably wouldn't even have saw it coming, you know, the only indicator that it was there was like, like the dead silence. It's you're like all of a sudden in a dead zone and, you know, it's a kind of a reality that's hard to describe because it's reality, but not reality. And it's just, it's weird. It's like being a, in a dream, but you're in real life and terrified. I mean, there, there was a fear that I felt that was so deep and, and primal that I've never felt that, that fear in my life ever. And, uh, I haven't felt it since these experiences happened, you know, because it was just something that was so intensely terrifying that that uh, I don't think anything compares in this world to it, you know? I mean, 
Jason off with your grizzly bear would be more preferable than seeing this thing again. <laughs> well, I don't know. Both would be pretty scary, but you know what I'm trying to say. It was, there's just nothing that compares to it really at all. No, I get it. I definitely get what you're saying. Do you have any opinions of why it singled you out the first time you saw it? I don't know. Other than maybe it knew that it would get a reaction out of me other than just running in terror because I did try to, I, I don't know how to, I wouldn't try to stand up to it, or, but it got a different reaction out of me probably than what most people would have done, I guess. And it knew it. It knew something about me because I'm telling you the way it was looking at me and looking through right into my soul. It was like it knew me. Like, and it's so hard to describe to people that something you've never seen before in your life and some creature like that. And you're having this weird, like, I don't know, kind of a mental communication in a way or something. But it was just more of, um, you know, not words or anything. It was feelings. And like, just like, you know, like when you look at somebody that you've known for a while and you know them, right? That's how it felt like it was looking at me. Like it knew me. It knew everything about me. Or, you know, I didn't know it, obviously. And it knew I was terrified. But. The only reason I think that it singled me out is maybe for something to that. I think it wanted to get a fun reaction for it. And it, it did. It, I just don't know if it was expecting the gun. Because like I said, when it saw it, it seemed a little surprised, but it recognized what it was. And I could see it when it, when it saw it. It just, it, it knew. But. I don't know. You know, I really don't know. I wish I did know. But, yeah, that is confusing to me. Oh, sure. Yeah, I realize it's hard to wrap your head around why it would look at you like it almost knew you, but, yeah, a lot of eyewitnesses have reported that. You told us about the satanic-looking graffiti you found on that concrete building. Do you think the dogman you encountered had been conjured or the graffiti was just happenstance? You know, I, I don't know. I've thought about that a couple times. And in Utah, we we had a big problem with, with satanic stuff going on and does. It's not talked about a lot, but it does happen around here. And I don't know if they conjured it there and knew what they were bringing in or if it had moved into that and they knew, you know, I, I don't know, but I'd probably go with they conjured it because it seemed like, like I said, it wasn't normal graffiti and it was words and symbols. And I'm sure it was some kind of ritual, you know, I mean, it's the only thing that I can ever think of on it, but I wasn't ever about to go back up there again and try to figure out what that stuff was. I didn't, I don't care. You know, I just, it was there. It was its home at that time. So it could have, but that's actually a good question. I don't know. I'm glad you guys didn't go back. I'm also glad you guys didn't go down into that basement. That wouldn't have been good. You and me both. <laughs> I don't think there would have been any way in this world any of us would have went down in there. You know how it is with three guys trying to be better than the other one, but everybody's completely chicken. You know, nobody's going down there, but I would, I hate to think of what would have happened if somebody did start to go down those stairs because it was there by the stairs. I mean, for all I know, it was watching us the whole time from the darkness. And cause I said, like I said, there was only like three foot by three foot square light lit up. That was from the sun casting down because it was a square hole that opened up into the floor and had the stairs that went straight down. But it probably watched us the whole time. I'm sure of it. And if somebody would have tried to go down those stairs, I, I don't think it would have hesitated. 
I really don't, especially with its its prey laying there, you know? I mean, yeah, that probably would have been a super bad scene. I'm really glad that we didn't. Yeah, well, that makes two of us, and I'm sure he was watching you the whole time. That's an eerie thought. How far would you say that building was from any other homes? Oh, it was... Well, we were up that canyon at least 10 miles by that point. And like I said, it was a super small town at that time. And the last house that we passed, once we got on the right road, was a good three miles from, well, I'd say more like two miles from the mouth of the canyon. And we had to be up there at least 10. So, and that's something I cannot figure out what, what the building was ever there for, but you could tell it had been there for a long time. I don't know if it was some kind of water play. I don't know. I don't know what would have been up there and why they would have built that up there, but it was there. Well, what was left of it was there. You'd tell it's super old building. I wouldn't even dare guess when it was built. It was that old looking concrete, like, like old fashioned concrete type of stuff. You know, the kind that you can tell they mixed it up themselves. Yeah, it does make you wonder what that building was. You said John never saw it. Did he seem to believe you when he told him about what you had seen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he, he felt the feeling, you know. I mean, there was no denying that part of it. There was nothing. And, yeah, he he knew. And he's kind of lucky he didn't look at it because he hasn't had to deal with that that image but you know we talked about it and um he could feel the like i said we talked about it a few times not very much i described the creature to him the best i could once but as far as like the quietness all of a sudden the overwhelming quietness and the weird feeling in the air yeah he, he knew there was something Something wasn't right at all. Well, I'm glad he did know that you weren't lying to him. That definitely helps. How sure are you that you encountered the same dog man each of the three times you had encounters? Well, going off the feeling that I got and the smell, I would say 100%. But without being an eyewitness to it, I can't be 100, so I'd say 99.9. I'd say it was the same creature. That had to have been. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Did you get more of a flesh and blood vibe off of it or a supernatural one? Oh, no, it felt real. It felt totally real. I'm, see, it, I'm trying to, I got so many different emotions going on right now that it's hard for me to describe things. Um, but no, I, I, I knew it was real. It was, it was a real, it was actually there. That thing was physical. It was there. I could have touched it, I bet. Probably wouldn't have got my hand back, but I probably could have touched it. But no, it was real. Yeah, trying to touch it, that wouldn't be a smart move. Reflecting on the conversations you had with that Navajo man, do you think they helped you or hurt you in the long run in your ability to deal with what happened to you? Um, He helped me. He definitely helped me because up until that point, I always had this uneasy feeling that I was still being watched or however you want to put it. But, uh, yeah, they definitely helped me. And it was, it was good to encounter somebody like that that pretty much knew exactly what it was. And had heard of it before, you know, it was familiar and they knew what to do. So yeah, they, they helped me in a big way and I'll forever be grateful for that. Oh, I can understand why you would be. Yeah. Sounds like he's a good man. I'm glad that he reached out to you the way he did. What was it about your encounters that's made it so hard for you to deal with them after all these years? Oh, it's just that deep, deep, terror and it's it's so hard to describe it is this this it's hard to control too 
Like you can tell I'm even to this day, um, it's just the feeling and how, how instant you like, you feel like, like you're nothing compared to this thing as far as power. You know what I mean? This, it was just totally intimidating, I guess, like unbelievably intimidating. And brings out this horrible, terrifying emotion that that uh, you're, you'll only experience from something like that, I think. So it's been hard for me, and it mixes up my emotions, like, super bad, you know. Even talking about it is like, it's just this big mixing pot of emotions, like, it's still scared terrified and, and I, I don't know just it's just a jumble of emotions to deal with from it and nothing has done that to me my whole life this is the only time i get like this is when when i try to deal with with this experience and it's it still brings it out so maybe i always will be tormented with it you know, maybe it's still getting what it wants because I think that's probably what it wanted was to play games and terrify me. And here I am, 27 years later, still haven't seen it, haven't even felt it, but I'm still all messed up from it. So, yeah, that's what I kind of feel like it was doing. Well, it's not easy to talk about it, but like I've told you before, every time you do talk about it, you're actually going to grow from that, so it's a definite net gain. From what I understand, your brother has a friend who works for the Bureau of Land Management that told your brother about an alarming problem that's going on right now in the Rocky Mountains. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, so like you said, he works for the BLM, and uh, Utah has a deal worked out with Yellowstone that when the grizzly bears or black bears get too used to the people and start getting aggressive to them because people are dumb and feed them and so they start relating humans with food they will take them out of that area and bring them down here because there's so much unpopulated area as far as the mountain range goes that you know they think they can safely transplant them here but uh they've been having a problem at this time when he told me they were having finding bears that were completely ripped apart, like just shredded. Like, and then they tried to blame it on other bears, but you know, he's telling my brother, "There's no way, there's no way," and not from what the the damage that is caused. And we're talking big black bears and, and grizzlies. We're not talking little cute cuddly bears we're talking things that can defend themselves but something's taking them apart and it's not people it's poaching them it's you can tell it's an animal on animal attack but you know it's hard to get them to talk about it nobody wants to everything's always so hush hush around here you know what i mean and they should be telling people hey stay out of this area even if they have to lie to them and tell them we got rogue bears or whatever, something going on, but they don't. They just keep it buried. I don't understand that, but in a way I do, in a way I don't. So, I mean, the mass majority of people out there aren't going to, you know, they're going to think everybody's completely cuckoo when you try to tell them about this. Hmm. I wonder what's strong enough to do that to a grizzly bear. Mm, I'd go with the dog, man. That thing that I saw would have been plenty strong enough. I, I know it wouldn't have a, a bit of trouble handling a bear. Zero. Zero trouble. No, oh, I'm sure it wouldn't. Since we're talking about how formidable dogmen can be, you've got a strong opinion about who would win a fight between a dogman and a Sasquatch. Please tell us more about that. Well, from what I've been told, because of some people that I've been lucky enough to know in my life that are familiar with 
both of them and both species and have long, long, long history with them and legends. And anyway, um, I have been told that the dog man would have no problem handling the Sasquatch. No problem. But they don't like each other at all. And that's where you don't have them really mixed together anywhere. They just, they pretty much stay separate. But from what I've been told, you don't want to mess with the dog man, even a Sasquatch. It's easy to think that since Sasquatch can be so big, 10, 11, sometimes 12 feet, that yeah, a 12 foot Sasquatch could have its way with a 7 foot tall dog man, but don't lose sight of the fact that, yeah, dogmen can get awfully big as well. There are very credible eyewitnesses out there I've spoken with who talked about seeing 10-footers, 11-footers, even 12-footers. So, yeah, if you pair up a 12-foot dogman against a 12-foot Sasquatch, unfortunately, yeah, my money would be on the dogman. Oh, yeah, mine too. If I understood you correctly, you didn't see anything from its waist down when it was staring at you over the campfire that night. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I could only see its midsection on up, and I didn't see its claws or hands, and I didn't see its legs, but that, you know, standing there, because it was over seven foot tall, easily, and it was, like, trying to describe it to you, is half in the dark, half in the light, and still in the, the growth of the trees, like, just on the edge of all of it, right there, just where I could get a good look at it, at his muzzle his wolf head and midsection but yeah i didn't i didn't get to see the rest of that didn't see anything of him and when he did turn to run i didn't it was so fast that it, it, i didn't even see him it was it was faster than when i pulled the trigger and i just hear him crashing through the, the trees and the bushes but like i said i don't think he was going away i think he was circling us but, you know, I have no proof of that either, other than when we lit out of there and you'd see him in the dust cloud. But even at that point, it's just more of a outline, you know, no, no hard definition. I just knew he was there. You could just tell he was there. Well, yeah, you were just doing the best you could to take it all in and not fall to pieces. So I totally understand. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Matt. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Um, just, you know, I wanted to thank everybody who listened and let me share this and, you know, understand. I've listened, I've seen comments from other people that are, like, dying to see one of these things. And it's not what it's cracked up to be. I mean, granted, I did say I feel like I'm a lucky in a way, but I'm also feel cursed in a way. And I wouldn't go tracking this thing down again. I wouldn't want to see or experience it again. Once is enough. And even if I just heard about it from someone like, like for me, that's been through it, it would be enough for me. I don't want to see it again. I don't want to deal with it, but they're there. They're real. And I wouldn't be too anxious to deal with one. I wouldn't be out hunting them down. Granted, they're, they might just be out to terrorize us, but you don't know that for sure either. They, you come across a, an aggressive one, and you're done. There's, there's no stopping these things. Shooting it wouldn't do one bit of good. I think you would make it mad. That's about it. And it would take you apart. So, you know, I just, my advice would be, if you hear about them in an area, stay out of that area. That's what I do now. Yeah, well, that's good advice. And yeah, like you said, I can think of things that would be a lot better for your health than trying to shoot one of these things. I always tell people, if you're going to shoot a dog man, only do it if you already are convinced it's going to kill you anyway. Matt, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. This is an honor. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me share. Oh, you know you're welcome. You are welcome. Well, thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, 
please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.